Welcome, good to see you here tonight. So glad that you chose to come out on a Friday night, nice cool Friday night, and uh, join together with others to worship and praise our Lord. And again, we gather together here tonight, not as a church, not as a denomination, but under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. And we gather together to worship him and to praise him. I invite you to stand at this time. We'll have an opening prayer. Then uh, Nelson Koblenz, Brother Nelson Koblenz, will come and lead us in some congregational singing. And then we'll have our scripture reading and prayer by Pastor Greg Woodrick, uh, who's at the Naumburg Mennonite Church. So let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, oh God, we, we come into your presence again here tonight. Grateful that we have a God who loves us, a God who cares about us, a God who created the world and everything in it, and a God who, when we ask, comes into our very hearts and lives there. So God, tonight we, we've come to worship you, we've come to praise you. And God, we just pray that as we do that tonight, that you would receive our worship, that it would be pleasing to you. And God, as well, that as we humble our hearts and as we quiet ourselves, and God, that once again you would speak. You would speak to our hearts, you would speak to our minds in that still, small voice. That voice that tells us that you love us, that you care about us, that you want to build that relationship with us or you want to start that relationship with us, that you know us intimately even better than we know ourselves. So God, we pray for that fresh wind of your Holy Spirit to blow through here this evening, to touch each and every heart. And we'll be sure to give you all the honor and the glory because you are worthy of it all. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Nelson? The church say amen. amen. Praise God. You know, the reason we come, we meet together, we sing, we preach the word of God is because we know that our Redeemer liveth. If you know that tonight, give a wave offering this evening. Amen. The psalmist, uh, actually Job, said in, Psalm, in uh, Job 19, verse 25, I think he said, And I know that my Redeemer liveth. And I know that someday on the earth he is going to stand. Let's sing this song and declare it to our master this evening. I know that my Redeemer liveth and on the earth again shall stand. His promise never faileth the word he speaks. It cannot die, it cannot die. The cruel death my flesh assail, yet I shall see him by and by. Let's sing it now. I know, I know that Jesus lived, that on the earth again shall stand. believe that, give him a clap offering of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. 
How many are happy and blessed tonight? Yeah, all right. Children, so many children uh, that are with us. And so this is for the sake of all you children tonight. And so this is going to be actually for all God's children. So we're all going to sing together and do some motions, a little cool this evening, you know, get our hands moving and our feet tapping a little bit. If you're happy and you know it, okay? Happy you know it, we're going to clap our hands, stomp our feet. Not too hard, dear Eugene, because this thing will, the grass won't matter. And then we're going to say amen, all right? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know, then your life will surely show. If you're happy and you know, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know, it's dump your feet. If you're happy and that's good grace. If you're happy and you know, and then your life will surely show. If you're happy, hey, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know, it's say amen. If you're happy and you know, it's say amen. If you're happy and you know, then your life will surely show. If you're happy and you know, it's say amen. Now, have you know it, wear a smile. But we're going to do something a little different. Have you know it, wear a smile. Yippee! Yeah. I know for some of you that's really a stretch. <laughs> but we're going to try it. A literal Yeah, thanks, Dave. A literal, a literal stretch. Okay. So, everybody say yippee and get your hand up. Ready? Yippee! All right, let's go. If you're happy and you know it, wear a smile. Yippee! If you're happy and you know it, wear a smile. Come on, young lady, your life will surely show. If you're happy and you know, wear a smile. Yippee! Oh, give yourself a hand. You did really good. Praise God. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glory. Yes. We will glory. again, just uh, a cappella. Hallelujah to the King. Yes, Lord. Who is the Oh, hallelujah, sing, and God bless you. You may be seated. Well, good evening. It is great to be here this evening in this beautiful tent on a beautiful Friday night. I was just thinking about it today as we were working along, just how beautiful this day is. And, and I think about Friday night, and I think about coming under the tent to worship Jesus Christ. It, just, it, get, it gets me excited. But Friday, usually on Fridays, I don't know if you're like me, but on Fridays, I tend to get to this point in the day and I start to wind down, right? I start getting a little tired. My day's done, my week's kind of coming to a close, I'm starting to look forward to the weekend. This is kind of that turning point in my, my week. And you can get tired. 
You can get dry. You can get exhausted, and you need a shot of life. You need something to get you excited, something to get you pumped up, something to get you going again. And I love coffee. I don't know about you, but I love coffee. And coffee is one of those drinks that can give you some energy, right? Unless you drink too much of it and your body starts becoming immune to the caffeine. But coffee can give you some energy, but it doesn't last forever. At some point, it dies off. At some point, it will stop. And you need more, right? You need something else to give you more energy. But there's one thing that never dies. There's one thing that never ends. There's one thing that breathes life every single time we turn to it. And that's the Word of God. And this evening, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 34. Psalm chapter 34 is a psalm that has always breathed life into me. Every time I read this psalm, doesn't matter where I am in my walk with Christ, doesn't matter where I am in my life, this psalm breathes life. So this evening as I read Psalm chapter 34, I want you to just listen, still yourself, quiet yourself, and allow the Holy Spirit to breathe life through his word. Psalm chapter 34, starting verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually Be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord, yet let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angels of the Lord encamp around those who fear him and delivers them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ear towards their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears And delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. None of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. And in verse 22, the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None, none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your word. We thank you for the truth that's in your word. We thank you for the life that's in your word. We thank you that in your word it says that none will be condemned if we put our faith and trust in you. Jesus, as we go through this evening, it's all about you. It's nothing about us. It's nothing about anything here. It is completely about you. So, Father, we pray that in this night you will receive all the honor and all the glory. May your Holy Spirit speak to us in whatever way we need to hear him. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, all our music is available on the digital platforms as well. Spotify, Apple Music, and Pandora, if you would choose to uh, listen to it uh, in that platform. All right. Well, are you all ready? What an incredible family this has been. We just counted such an honor to minister together. And, you know, we don't have this privilege very often, just a few times a year in some of our uh, bigger functions where we have the privilege of ministering together. And we just love all of them, from the very youngest to the very oldest. I don't know which one's the oldest, if it's you or Katie Ann, but we'll just leave that. Uh, But from the very youngest to the very oldest, we just love them all so dearly. And we are so, so grateful. I've said this many times. You have the privilege of taking a family like this into prison. And minister, you really don't need a preacher. Because the message is preached. And it gives them hope just to see a family that loves each other. And we're so grateful. Would you welcome the Stolzfus family again here tonight?
Yes, we are the people to praise God. Us as his children, we have reasons to praise him because of what he has done for us. May we be the, the children, may we be his children, those who give honor and glory where the, where the honor is due. Um, the next song the girls are going to do is Living in Me, and it talks about Jesus Christ.
Does, does Jesus still raise the dead today? I think he does. It says, when you were dead in your trespasses and sin, hath he quickened or raised to life. I believe that today with all my heart. He still raises the dead. And I'm so grateful for that. And he lives in us and gives us power to do the unthinkable. So we're going to introduce our family. For those maybe who weren't here the other night, uh, my wife and I, Katie Ann, my own Katie Ann Stolz, who's from Kinzers, Pennsylvania, uh, married 25 years. We have 10 children, nine with us here. Our oldest daughter's married. They have one grandchild. Uh, our oldest daughter, they have one grandchild, right? Oh, we have one grandchild. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. All right. Barbie Ann's next. She's 22. Wilma's 20. Uh, Joshua's 17. Carrie is 15. Emily is 12. Malachi is 10. Adro is 7. Jalen is 4. And Kezia is 2. So we're, we live in Kinzer's full-time farmer there. Uh, as much as I'm at home, and then we do part-time traveling with Gospel Express from there. So uh, this week we had the privilege of being here for three days, and then we'll go home next week. I'll be working in the fields, and then I'll be back for the last three days of the meeting. So, so grateful for that opportunity. The next song here is Horse and the Rider.
has always been a, uh, an inspiration or a, a, f- a light for me is when I meet a new believer who's just on fire, and it always lights me up, and uh, it's such a blessing to be able to have that in our congregations that, that God calls us to multiply, and I believe that means just to have new life coming up all the time, and, and it just it just creates something inside of us when we meet new believers. We've got to do one more song, and this song is... Uh, My Redeemer Lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives lives who once was dead. He lives my ever-living head. He lives to bless me with his love. He lives to plead for me above. He lives my hungry soul to feed.
Oh, come on. Let's give God a clap offering of praise tonight. Woo! He lives. He lives. I was sitting there and Marin was thinking about it that, uh, what song did we start with tonight? I know that my Redeemer lives. I just, I love affirmations and confirmations. When you start to sing it, then I'm like, Wow. It's about worshiping our living Savior. And that's what it is, preaching the Word of God. Um, Charles Finney said, Revival cometh not except through an extended exposure of the Word of God. An extended exposure of the Word of God. Why? Because Jeremiah said, Is my word not like a fire? Is it not like a hammer? That breaketh the rock into pieces. And as the hammer of the word keeps on going, our hearts get softer and softer because there's kind of a tendency of our hearts getting hard, calloused. And so the word night after night has a way of ministering to us and softening our hearts that maybe we're hearing things we maybe heard before, but now it's over and over again. That's how the Holy Spirit works in drawing us to his bosom. Some of you were not here the last couple nights, maybe, and you're not sure who this brother is that's coming up here. <laughs> well, he knows Jesus, and Jesus knows him. Yes, Dave it. Miller and Dave and his family have been part of the ministry, going over 22 years now. And uh, last night, had his wife Ruth Ann up here, and all the children, children were singing, and he introduced all of them. And by the way, talking about Grandpa, uh, yeah. Mel was talking about they have one grandchild. Well, this brother <laughs> is about, <laughs> whoo, you about to become a grandpa. Shoot. I can't hardly believe that. But, oh, yeah, give God a clap off yeah. and then I show up. And I'm Amen. Not even, and I'm not even old yet. You're not even old. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> not even old yet. Oh, well, we have, we have 16, and some of you have a whole lot more. So, But anyhow, uh, but waiting for that phone call from northern Indiana. When that call comes, his wife Ruth Ann will be here no more. Yeah. <laughs> She'd be gone. She'd be gone. That's the way it ought to be. Yeah. And, uh, and so we're so grateful. We're so grateful for the power of the gospel. And uh, would you join us in praying here tonight? Yes. Stretch your hand you, forth Jesus. again Hallelujah, here this evening. Heavenly you, Father, Jesus. we thank you tonight for your precious love, mm. your abundant mercy, your amazing grace. And, Lord, we ask one more time again, Lord, here this Jesus. evening, 
Lord, if you would favor Brother Dave, Lord God, and you would just anoint him, anoint his lips, Lord, and you, speak Jesus. to his heart, Lord, and follow, flow through him through the Holy Spirit yes, to Jesus. share what you have in mind here this evening. Yes, and then, Lord, take it to our hearts, not only to be hearers, but then to be doers of your word. We pray, Lord, this place tonight is holy ground, Jesus. heavenly territory Jesus. here this evening, God, that you may be glorified Amen. as you are lifted up. We give you all the glory, the praise, and the honor in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. 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 You may be seated. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you so much. And again, I greet you tonight in that precious, holy, and worthy name. Again, that name that is above every name, someday we will bow before him. Amen. What an honor to bow in his presence and just night after night. Thank you so much for coming tonight again. And just the, I was telling the boys back there at the sound booth before I came up here and those up here, it just, I love to hear the, all the, all the chatter going on, all the fellowship going on, the the, the interaction with one another as people arrive and just the, the camaraderie and the things that are going on. You know, the, it's, it's, uh, it's as we become one in spirit, one in Christ, those kind of things happen. And we are so, so grateful. So again, greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Very um, different way to begin here tonight. I, the Lord kept bringing this passage to my heart all day long, and I finally, just before I came out here, said, yes, Lord, I will use it if you, if you give it to me. Um, it is, it's, I don't know that I've ever used this scripture, especially not with this subject, uh, but somehow the Lord had kept speaking to me about um, going swimming tonight. <laughs> It's a little chilly, I know. But how many of you ready to go swim tonight? Now, I better explain before you answer that, right? Uh, what I would like to do, I don't have it on the PowerPoint. I'm not even going to ask you to turn to it. I'm just going to ask you to just listen as this word will be read. It's in Ezekiel 47, the first nine verses. And I want to just read them to you because God spoke them to me. And I, I, just, I was in my little camper just even this afternoon and tonight just after we had the wonderful meal. And just, I was just reading it over and over again. And I, I just, I just, I, it, it just gave me goosebumps. It just gave me tears. It just ministered to my heart. And I want to share that with you here tonight. You can close your eyes. You can leave them open. You can do whatever. Just listen to the precious Word of God. And this is a vision that Ezekiel had. And it says this. Ezekiel 47 verse 1. In, and I'm going to read it out of the NLT version. In my vision the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. And there I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple. And passing to the right of the altar in its south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway. And he led me around the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet. And then he led me across, and the water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet. He led me across again. This time the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. And then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but too deep to walk through. He asked me, have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the riverbank. And when I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. 
And there will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. And life will flourish wherever this water flows. What does this remind us of? There's many things we could get from this passage. But who is the life-giving water? Who is the one that refreshes us? If I would read John 4, verse 10, when Jesus was ministering there to the woman at the well, he answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. Tonight, I want to call us into, I, I, I don't want us just to go angle deep, just to go waist deep, just to go neck deep, but we want to go all in, all in and hold nothing back and swim in the life-giving water of the life giver, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Behold, what is behind the veil, that moment when Jesus died and gave up the ghost and gave up his life. The veil was ripped from the very top all the way to the bottom to give us access right into the very holy of holies. And that is where the life-giving water is. And many people today are hesitant to let the Holy Spirit take them there. But tonight I pray that we will go there and swim all in. Are we ready? Are we ready? Let's go. Hallelujah. Um, before we go there, or well, this is part of getting there. This, this was also very much on my heart today. And tonight when the Stallsfuses were singing this song, I, I don't know all the lyrics, but there was a phrase in there about Jesus. He's the one that walks on the water, but then he is the one that lives in me. Now we're going to talk about the temple tonight, about how, how that when Jesus died, what happened inside that temple when that curtain was rent. And here in this passage where Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he went into the temple, and it says, he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the tables of the money changers of the seeds of them that sold doves. He said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Now, talking about the literal temple, he went in there. But now, let's translate that over into the new covenant. Christ in us. Who is the temple of the living God? We could go to 1 Corinthians, is it chapter 3 or 6 or one of those. Who is the temple of the living God? You and I are now the temple. Born again by the Spirit of God, we are now the temple of God. And I hope I never get over the fact, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is now in you, in you, in you. That very power. Would you agree? It took an incredible power to come and roll the stone away. That Easter morning, that, that resurrection rolled the stone away. The power of God raised Jesus from the dead. And the moment that you say yes to Jesus and get born again, that power is within us. Yes. Woo. I, I think of Brother Laverne Swartz. Shoo. He used to be preaching away, and he he just and he, he would say, "How can we just sit there like that?" <laughs> I mean, think about it. Jesus, the one who walked on the water, the the power of God that came, rolled the stone away. All of those things. That very power is within the believer. Life giving power. Life-giving power. Hope I ne never get over it. Hope I never get over it. Think about it tonight. Matthew chapter 27. Now, that was all before the message. Advancing my personal worship. Last night, we talked about the closet life and establishing that or renewing that. Tonight, we want to we go deeper. We want to go swimming all in tonight. But here... In Matthew chapter 27, if you would go there, Matthew 27, this is where Jesus was on the cross. And of course, before he died, we know this story very well about the ninth hour. 
where Jesus cried with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's going through all that. And then in verse 50, Matthew 27, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. But I want to zero in tonight on verse 51. I'll read it again, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. I picture that scene, that afternoon, that day, Jesus there hanging on the cross, and when he died, he gave up the ghost when he died. He had all of us in mind became sin for us, he who knew no sin, so that we may be made the righteousness of God through him. There he hung, and there he died. And this veil in the temple. Now the purpose of this veil was, we all know the story, I imagine, but the purpose of this veil was to separate the holy place from the most holy place. And I find that many believers today, we become more comfortable on the outside than on the inside. And I pray, my prayer is tonight that the Holy Spirit would take us right on in. Where it would even shake us loose from the comfort of the outskirts of it all. Where maybe on the outside we're angle deep or we're knee deep or we're waist deep. But on the inside we're all in. We're not holding back. In fact, what made this very real to me a few years ago, we were at a place having revival meetings at a church. And it was one of those that we didn't really know the people. They didn't really know us. We were invited there through a uh, reference. Somebody uh, recommend it to the pastor to invite us to come. That, that's how we uh, got invited there for meetings. And so we didn't really know them and they didn't really know us. We knew uh, maybe one or two families in the congregation. And so the first night started and the children were up front singing and I'm, I'm back there at the soundboard and I'm just like, hmm, this is really, it just, it just a little bit you know, the way it is. But hey, they're getting to know us. We're getting to know them. I get up to preach and, and it was just like, Wow, we're, you know, I, I wanted to say, are you all alive? Like, are you breathing out there? You know, that, that type of thing. But I, no, I didn't. But, you know, it was, it was one of those moments. And, and it was just like, I said, hey, Lord, just, just help me. Just help me. It, it, it shouldn't make a difference in my, in my zeal and my passion. It, it just, it shouldn't affect me, should it? So, Lord, just, just, just give me a grind. I thought, well, hey, the first night, once the first night is done, second night, we rolls, rolls around, and, and we get up there and sing and share and, and preach again. Same thing. Just, 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 a, just the same thing. Finally, by about the third night, same thing. I remember when I got out to the bus, I told the family, guys, I'm done. Let's get out of here. I mean, I'm just being honest. That, that's how I felt. Now, I knew that wasn't the right thing to do. The Lord convicted me immediately of that attitude, and I repented. I knew it wasn't right. But God forgave me. And I thought, well, I think we started on a Wednesday night. Finally, I thought, well, Saturday night. Saturday night will be the breakthrough. Same thing. I'm like, all right. Maybe Sunday morning. <laughs> maybe Sunday morning. Before we had preaching time, I sat in a men's Sunday school class. There was about seven or eight men in a circle, and then um, the teacher, he opened up the class, and he said, well, brothers, uh, before we get into the Sunday school lesson, I would love to hear from some of you, what has God been speaking to you about this week? Of course, I'm sitting there like, good question, brother. 
I had the same thing, I had the same question. It was just better if he asked it than me, right? Now, in any of this, please understand my heart. There is, no, there is not one ounce of criticism against this congregation or, or believer. There, there is no one ounce of criticism here. I'm just using it as an illustration. And he said, I'm just going to open it up. What has God been speaking to you about this week? And I'm sitting there, and just without hesitation, one of the, in fact, he was a very influential person in that congregation. He, he, um, he just, one of the first words out of his mouth was like, well, he said, well, let me just be really honest with you. And then he paused. And then my heart started beating. I mean, well, okay, it was already beating. It just started beating faster. And I was like, when he, when, he said, when he said, well, let me just be really honest with you, you know, and then he pauses and I'm like, I, like did, did I say something wrong or did I preach something wrong or whatever? And uh, apparently that week I was preaching on getting into the presence of God and just worshiping him and whatever all. And, and then he goes on to say, he said, you know, what we've been hearing this week, can I be really honest with you? He said, it actually scares me. And when he said that, my heart broke because it told me everything. It told me everything and why we sense what we did. Now, I remember driving away from there, and, and God moved that morning and that night, and, and, and again, no ounce of criticism here in any way, shape, or form. But I remember when we left that place, and I was driving down the road, and I was thinking of this. And I said, Lord, how many does that represent in the body of Christ? How many does that represent in the body of Christ? You know what? Many times I become more comfortable just, I call it the porch life. You know what? You come home from a hot day of working and you're sweaty and you're dirty and you shower up men and you, you shower up, you sit on the porch and your, your wife brings you a, you know, your favorite drink and there's a breeze blowing through. It kind of feels like tonight it's nice and cool and refreshing and there's a breeze blowing through and she brings you your favorite, you know, drink, pink lemonade or whatever, well better yet Coke Zero or whatever. Hint, hint. Uh, that, re that reminds me, you know what? I I, th this is coming to mind, so I got to tell you, I, I used this illustration at another church we were having meetings some years ago, and, and, and one night afterwards we went to a restaurant for a birthday party, and the lead pastor calls me on the phone, and he said, hey, are you at so-and-so place? This is after the service that night, are you at so-and-so place? And I said, yes. He said, well, something you said tonight, I want to talk to you about it. The lead pastor. And I was like, oh, I mean, I, I didn't act nervous. I said, oh, sure, I'd love to talk to you about it. And he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be down. And he came and then, and, and I was already inside. I expected him to come inside. So he calls me again. He said, hey, I'm out here in the van waiting on you. Then I got really nervous. So I, I, I walk out and, and, and I walk right up to his door. I mean, my heart's up here. I, and I'm thinking back of what I said and what I did and all of that. And I was like, I don't know that I did anything wrong, you know. And, and, and he rolls down his window. had this little smirk on his face. And he reaches down to the right on the floor. And he comes up with a six-pack of Coke Zero. Man, I want to slap that guy. But what a blessing. I appreciated it. But where was I going with that? But you're, you're, you're sitting on the porch and you're just enjoying the, you know, the, but, but eventually that Coke Zero, that pig, eventually it's going to run out. You're going to have to get up and go get more or you're going to dry up. And many people are become satisfied on the outside because we just feel like we're in, but we're sitting on the outside. In fact, on the outside, on the porch, we still have control of our life. And the reason we are scared sometimes and hesitant to say, Lord, take me right into the Holy of Holies is because it caused the stripping of the self-life, which I am often not willing to let go. Often not willing to let go. A stripping of the self-life. We just become comfortable there because we're still in control of things. We're still in control of our life. Now, let's look a little bit at this uh, curtain or actually oh look at this I came across this some time ago my Africa friend had it on social media and I took a screenshot of it and I've been using it this is what can happen on the porch our devotional life our prayer life all of that just becomes a religious duty rather than a 
relationship. Never approach prayer and studying God's word as an obligation to be fulfilled, but you approach it as a privilege to be enjoyed. That's the difference between sitting on the porch or say, Lord, take me into the Holy of Holies. You know, we understand perhaps what it means when that curtain was ripped for the unbeliever. Now anybody has access right into the presence of God. But does it mean anything to us who've been walking with the Lord for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or 50 years? Spiritually speaking, that veil is still open. On the porch, my devotional life, my prayer life, it becomes a religious obligation or a religious duty rather than a fulfillment to be enjoyed. That's the difference. We get in, we say, Holy Spirit, take me into the Holy of Holies. Shake me loose. Shake me loose from becoming comfortable and control of my own life. Never approach prayer and studying God's word as an obligation to be fulfilled but approach it as a privilege to be enjoyed. Another one, Oswald Chambers, we were referring to the devotional. Beware of any work for God that causes or allows you to avoid concentrating on Him. A great number of Christian workers worship their work. The only concern of Christian workers should be their concentration on God. Anything we do, anything we do, including what I'm doing now, should it not come out of my relationship with Him. But on the outside, it becomes a religious duty. God engineers another Oswald Chambers. God engineers everything and wherever he places us. Our one supreme goal should be to pour out our lives in wholehearted devotion to him in that particular work. Behold, the veil in the temple was rent. What happens on the outside? I wrote this down some time ago. What happens on the outer courts is you can perform religious or right acts without surrender. And you know what happens on the outside? We compare ourselves among ourselves, but in the presence of God, we compare ourselves to the holiness of God. And we come to the point where Isaiah did, I saw the Lord, holy, 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 holy. In the presence of God, we compare ourselves to the holiness of God. On the porch, we compare ourselves among ourselves, and the Bible says that's not wise. Look at this in Exodus 26, verse 33. This is the purpose of the, the veil, hang the inner curtain from the clasp, put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. But then in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, look at this. When these things were all in place... The priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. Look at that. They performed their religious duties, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place on only once a year. Can you imagine if that were still that way? Some of us live that way. Are you all breathing out there? Think about it. Some of us... And I'm including myself at times. We live that way. Just sitting on the outside, comfortable, performing religious acts. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. That's in Hebrews chapter 9. So what religious acts am I performing on the outside? On the porch, we compare ourselves among ourselves instead of saying, holy, holy, holy. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you will. We'll see another thing that happens on the porch. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And this is where Paul was addressing the, the church at Corinth. I'll start in verse 10 where he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which, the house of Chloe, that there are no contentions among you. <clears throat> now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you with Crispus and, but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name 
And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What was happening here? Paul is addressing the church in verse 12. Now I say this. He's talking to the church. That every one of you say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of so-and-so, and I'm of so-and-so. Does that happen today? In fact, the reason he's addressing the church is because of that kind of a lifestyle, it was causing divisions. If I could break it down this way. What was happening in the body of Christ was people were following people rather than Christ. And when we do that, when we have our focus on people here on earth more than we have our focus on Christ, you know what happens? People will let us down. We will make mistakes, even spiritual giants, even um, uh, anointed pastors and leaders. There are times when those will make a mistake. And if we're following them and they make a mistake, our life is affected by that. But if we are following the Almighty and not them, they can make a mistake and we will see what we can do to help rally around them and bring them back. And that's what I believe Paul was addressing. Don't follow people. Uh, we know of a, a very, we probably all recognize the name, I'm not going to use it for the sake of protection, but a very large ministry organization some years ago where the founder of this ministry was accused of certain things. And I'm not here to say it was true or false. That's not the point here. And it was a ministry that my wife and I and family have gleaned a lot of insights, a lot of encouragement, a lot of truth that was taught has impacted our life. But all the way through, even when our children were young, I would always encourage our children, just remember, any conference, any function, any place you go, we're not following this organization. We're only going there to receive encouragement, be instructed, be, yeah, be encouraged so that we become closer to the one who never fails. And during this time, when this was happening, some of our friends would talk to us, and their life just seemed like falling apart. What are we going to do? Did you hear about this man? Did you hear? What are we going to do? Like, and I was like, why would this? Now, I was saddened. We, we were saddened in our hearts about these accusations, and, and I didn't know, was it true or false? I, it wasn't any of my business whether it was true or false. And I was saddened that it happened. But my spiritual life was not affected by the mistakes that this man made. Because I was not following this man. We were not following this man. We were following the Almighty, the solid rock. On the porch we follow people, but on the inside we follow Christ. And so if our, our leaders, and our, I mean, we're leaders, I mean, we will make a mistake. And I will say this. I pray that these two weeks... Well, let me say it this way. If after these two weeks, you are drawn more to us as Gospel Express than you are to Christ, then we have not done our job. We have not done our job. Can I be bold enough to say, I don't want, we don't want any one of you to follow us. Now, we are here to encourage, we're here to, 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 you know, whatever. So all of us, we're here to encourage one another. We're here to build each other up in the faith. And we influence one another. Yes, we do. But ultimately, do not follow us. But follow the one who has died for us. Follow the one who is in heaven waiting to come back and receive us. That's the one. He is faultless. He's true. He's holy. He's righteous. He's solid. Depend on him. On the porch, we follow each other. But on the inside, we go deeper and deeper. And we swim in the river of life-giving water, 
day in and day out. And our foundations and our roots go deeper and deeper and deeper as we build that relationship out of joy. That's what Paul was addressing here. Don't follow people. Or maybe, maybe let, let's just use, um, uh, I, I can't use you. Uh, well, may, wh why don't I just do this? Maybe it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. How about that? Okay. No, but, but let, let's just say, since you're up here anyway, um, and let's see, uh, give me your name again. Greg, yes, sorry. I, I, it was on the paper, but I forgot. Now, see, both of you attend, or you're on the leadership at Nuremberg, right? Okay, perfect illustration here. So now, uh, nothing to do with the church, nothing to do with it, it just happens, you're just at the right place at the right time, hallelujah. So I'm not going to ask anybody here, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, how many of you from Nuremberg Church, uh, I'm not going to do that. But those of you who are, let's just say that you may have this idea that, well, Myron's my man. Ah, Myron's my man. Man, I like, I like not Greg, no, 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 Greg's my man. I mean, I like his style. Now, I understand. We all have different styles and different giftings. And, and maybe, maybe, we're, you know, maybe we're drawn more to a certain style of preaching. There's, I, there's room for that. I, I get that. But I'm talking about how that, we, how that we treat them, how that we look at them, how that we even, when we have our opinion, we go to a certain one because we know they will agree with us, but the other one won't. Ooh. I've been there. And I've had it happen to me. Think about it. You're never to follow Myron. You're never to follow Greg or Titus or, or anyone or the pastor of your church. They're there to encourage, to shepherd, and to protect, and, and to influence. But we're ultimately to follow the Almighty, the perfect one. Because sooner or later, you know what happens? If we follow these people, you follow us, we're going to make a mistake. We're going to do something that you don't like. We're going we're, we're to make a mistake. That should not affect your spiritual life. Because who are we following? And that's what Paul is saying. Well, some of you say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of, I'm of this, I'm of that. Hold it. On the porch, we do that. But on the inside, holy, holy, holy. Then if our leaders make a mistake, you know what? We're going to pray for them. On the outside... We'll pick up the phone and we'll call. Did you hear what our pastor did? Did you hear what so-and-so did? And not, even on not, not just on leadership. You know, brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter if we're in leadership or not, what happens on the porch, somebody mistreats us. And we come up with a plan how to get even. But on the inside, we come up with a plan how we can be reconciled. Reconciled. Anybody ever spoken death to you? Words of death, criticism? Now we're not to reject criticism. According to Proverbs, is it 15? We don't have to receive the spirit, but when people say something, come to us, confront us. Can I receive it? Can I be open to it? Look at it. You know, on the porch, we come up with a plan how to get even. On the inside, we say, Lord Jesus, teach me. Teach me. Divisions. Think about it tonight. Last night, we talked a little bit about popcorn. I don't know that there's a verse referring to popcorn. As much as Nelson makes it and gives it away, I'm surprised there's not a verse. This brother has given more popcorn away than probably all of us together. Well, I don't know how to say it. Remember, he doesn't love it. He just, he just enjoys it. He loves Jesus, but he enjoys popcorn. <laughs> but did you ever think about how popcorn pops? Do you ever think about how popcorn pops? You know, you have this little hard shell kernel. Just hard, small, some yellow, some white, some big, some small, whatever. There's several ways to make popcorn. You can choose the 
I call it kind of the, the uh, when I was a little Amish boy, you know, we, we had this little crank or little knob thing on top, like kind of a kettle idea. I think, do you actually still use that? You do? Okay, he still uses that. But I, I call it this, uh, and there's nothing wrong with this at all. Uh, but it, it, it's the kettle thing with a little knob on top, and you spin it, and then you, it pops, and you shake it, and you dump some out, and then you go back, and okay, you have that style. And then you have microwave option. I mean, it's an option, but it's kind of in a pinch in our house. But then you have the stir-crazy option, which is our favorite. I mean, that's about the least amount of work I've found in making popcorn. I mean, you plug the thing in, and you put oil in there, and it just kind of does it for you. I mean, you've got a few little things to do, but let's just use the stir-crazy for the sake of not confusing people. So you plug the thing in an outlet. You pour oil in there. And that little wire thing goes around, and that element on the inside, it heats up the oil, and you take a cup of popcorn, and you dump it on there, and this thing keeps spinning and spinning and spinning, and all of a sudden, w what's happening here? Uh, by the way, this is not a cooking class. We are actually leading to an illustration with this. But this thing is going around and around and around. What is happening at this moment? What is on the inside of this little kernel? It's moisture. So you have this little hard shell with moisture on the inside, and this stuff is dumped into a very hot environment. And so it starts heating up, and as, that, as it starts heating up because of this hot environment, because of this hot oil, pressure begins to build from the inside out. And so this moisture, when there is enough heat coming through, this moisture eventually uh, turns into vapor. And when that moisture turns into vapor, there is so much pressure coming from the inside that that outer hard shell can no longer contain the pressure and it will break and it will pop because it was put in the right environment. The point is this. On the outside, we live our life from the outside in. And our life becomes harder and more controlling and more dogmatic when we say, Holy Spirit, take me into the Holy of Holies. We begin living from the inside out. And that hardness and that, that hard outer shell will break to pieces in the presence of God. We will become soft and broken and surrendered and yielded and say, yes, Lord, I want to swim with you. I want to go all in. In other words, on the inside, we live from the inside out. But on the porch, we live from the outside in. Which do I choose? Which do I choose? Do you ever try to eat on pop popcorn? If we've ever tried it, it probably wasn't a very good experience. But one day, I was meditating on this whole thing. and I just, just in a, it was, it was honestly just a word picture that the Lord gave me. And I saw a crowd of people. I had no idea where it was or who it was, nothing. It was just, it was just a crowd of people in front of me. And all of a sudden, just through the, just much, much, much like this is what it looked like. And all of a sudden, in this audience, I began to see people just, several there, several there, they just popped up. Just like if three or four in that section would just stand, and three or four more, just all over, just people just popping up. I'm like, hmm, like popcorn Christianity. Yeah, Lord, what are you speaking to me about? And I began to listen, and I heard, I just, I just sensed the Spirit of God saying, you know, so many unpopped Christians. <laughs> just sitting on the outside, just being okay. Friend, if we want revival, and we want the fullness of the anointing and the power, okayness is not okay. But we want to go deep. Holy Spirit, take me in. Um, Hebrews 4.16, help me out. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. We may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Not be afraid to come to the throne of grace confidently, not arrogantly, not proudly, but confidently knowing that in the presence of God, he's going to break us. He's going to empower us. He's going to clean us up. Broken lives I was picturing today.
How many are sitting here tonight? Maybe a few that just feel, you know, it's hardly worth living anymore. Shattered lives, maybe feel hopeless. What am I going to do next? In the presence of God, he brings all the pieces together. In the holy of holies, he brings all the broken pieces together. If we just come to him. We just come to him. It is amazing to me. Not only does he save us, but he cleans us up. Changes us from glory to glory. Empowers us. Anoints us. He does it all. But sometimes I want to do it. And on the porch, we can accomplish a lot. But in the presence, our accomplishments are stripped. And his accomplishments rise to the top. Tonight at the invitation, after a while, use another illustration. But tonight, at the invitation time, be simply something like this. Lord, would you not allow me to sit on this porch? Lord, take me in. Take me in. The whole way. The whole way. I know many of you are there. But in case we're not. Hallelujah. That veil is still open. Spiritually speaking, that veil is still open. Some years ago, we were first starting what we're doing back in the 90s, late 90s. We were praying and asking the Lord for confirmation for even coming on with the ministry here. And the leadership of the church at that time when we were attending, leadership of the church, the mission board, they were all behind us, just full blast, full tilt. And one morning in my prayer closet, my prayer time, the Lord began to speak to me about the entire congregation. We had a wonderful church. The Lord began to speak to me about, you know, wouldn't it just be a blessing to know that the entire congregation would be in support of what you're sensing to move toward. And I had a little argument with the Lord about it, but finally said, yes, Lord. So I approached our leadership team and I said, uh, Brothers, I'm under your authority. I trust you. But here's what God spoke to me about. I don't know if you have any input for me on this, but would you have a way or would you consider taking a vote from the whole congregation as to where we sense God is calling us? The pastors immediately said, oh, great idea. We'll do it. So they did. I don't know how they went about to do it because I wasn't part of the voting. But they did, and they got back to me, and they gave a very, very encouraging report. Large congregation at that time still is. They came back with the report to say, out of the whole congregation, about three brothers shared some concerns about it. And I was like, really? That's great, isn't it? Yep, that is great. Out of a whole congregation like that, only three? I was rejoicing. Hallelujah. Then another morning, a little while later, one morning in my prayer time, the Lord began to speak to me about the three brothers. Now, I know none of you get this carnal, but I again argued with the Lord. And I said, Lord, what do you mean about the three brothers? They are outvoted. Don't you know that's just tough for them? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just, that, that, that's what I was feeling. You know, it's like, hey, out of a whole congregation, these three brothers, I mean, they're so outvoted. I don't know if they even realize it, but that's just tough. I mean, that's the way this works, right? 
I wasn't sure what to do, and I finally came to the place where I said, Lord, if you want me to do something with this, would you keep bringing it back? But if you don't, then just remove it from me. And it kept coming back, and it kept coming back. And I finally said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I went back to the leadership. I said, again, I'm under your authority. I trust you, brothers. If you don't think this is a good idea, you tell me, and I'm okay with it. But if you feel it would be a good idea for me to talk to these three brothers, I would need to know who they are. Would you give me their names? And without hesitation, the lead pastor said, absolutely. In fact, I would encourage you to talk to them. I was kind of hoping he wouldn't say that, but he did. And I said, all right, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. I called up the one brother. I said, hey, I understand you have some concerns here. And could we meet for dinner one night? He said, sure, I'd love to. Met at a restaurant across the table from each other. And I said, hey, brother, I love you in Jesus' name. I want you to know that. I said, I understand you have some concerns about our move and all of that. And I said, I'm just here. I'm an open book. I have nothing to hide. I just invite you to just, my, my life is an open book. S share with me. And he did. And then he one of his concerns was, now this was back in the late 90s, you know, and he said, yeah, you know, he says, I just want to encourage you, you know, he said, you hear of these evangelists and they're out there and they're gone and their families at home and they're, you know, falling by the wayside and all of that and, and, and you know, the, your, your, your fatherhood and all of that. He said, I just want to warn you, don't let that happen to you. And I looked across the table and I said, brother, God bless you. Thank you. I need to hear that. I was a young father. I said, I need to hear that. Thank you. I received that. And then he shared some other concerns, not about me personally, just, just about some other things and all of that, which was not an issue. But when he was all done, I looked at him and I said, Brother, in spite of what you shared, could you give your blessing in us moving forward with this? He said, oh, absolutely. I want you to know I stand behind you. And I was like, well, that wasn't so hard. I mean, I'd tell him that, but I was like, that, that wasn't so hard. So I had two more to go. Well, then the next brother, I, I did not, not, these are brothers I went to church with now. This is, this is brotherhood here. This is people I went to church with. And one Sunday after church, I, I, the Lord just timed it, and I walked up to one brother. I said, hey, my life is an open book. I understand you have some concerns about it. And it was not quite the same experience as what, the first one was, I got saved in 91, this was in 98 or 9, somewhere in there, and so I was a fairly young Christian. I had up to that point, I had, as a Christian, I had never had anybody, now back in the wild days, before I was saved, we had arguments and heated discussions and all that, that was pretty common back then. But since I was saved, I had never had another Christian, another brother I went to church with, talk to me like that man did. I mean, it was up one side and down the other, and it hurt. If I can just, I don't know how else to put it. It was, it just hurt. Deep hurt. And God gave me the grace. I mean, I wanted to tell that man a thing or two about his life. I mean, but God gave me the grace. And I just, I thanked him for sharing with me. And I said, I appreciate it. Let me look at it. And one of the first things after that discussion... I said, Lord, just help me. Help me to look at what he said. Look at my own life. Look at what he said. But the pain that I'm feeling right now does not compare to the pain that you went through on the cross. And I will choose to forgive that person. And put your love in my heart for him as I process this. I prayed, I shared with my wife what happened. We prayed. A week or so later, I talked to the other brother, the third one. Very similar. Different situations, but very similar. Up one side and down the other. And that hurt came right back. Came right back. 
And God gave me the grace to do the same. Forgive, but look at my own heart. And then, a week or two later, I'm on the mission board at the time at that church, and a week or two later, the second or the third brother came walking toward me after church. It wasn't me going to him. It was him walking toward me. And immediately, because God, God, had, God, God had put love in my heart. And, it, and it, it was one of those where I could, I, I said, Lord, j- just give me that love. And, and when I had a chance, I gave him a good old, like, Jesus hug. Like, you know, there, there's a little bit of stiff arming going on at church sometimes. Like, you know, how you doing, brother? Kind of out of obligation or so. But I mean, I, I'm, lo- I'm looking for a Jesus hug. Where there's no wall, where there's like, I love you in Jesus, and it, yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Just, just like that, just like that, brother. I know the first time I caught you off guard, but, but you know, it, it, it's just like, like those kind of, and, and God put it in my heart. He, he put this agape love in my heart. And, well, every, every chance I had, I would just, I would just, hey, God bless you, and, and just, just gave him the good old, you know, Jesus hug, and, and, and just, just embraced him. And, and it was not put on. It was, but see, friend, what, what I'm going with this, on the porch, I would come up with a plan how to get even with them. But because I was in the presence of no credit to me, but I allowed the Holy Spirit to take me into the Holy of Holies. Therefore, he broke my heart. He put his love in my heart for them. And you watch what happens. This third brother came walking up toward me, and he had kind of a step, and I knew he had an agenda. And that morning, I had shared up front something about the mission report or something. He just come up to me, and he shook my hand. He was a little shorter than I am. He looked up at me, and he said, Brother, I just want you to know God has so gifted you. God has gifted you in, in speaking and sharing and, and, and all of that. And, and, and I'm, I'm standing like, it is totally not what I expected. Oh, me of little faith. And he, he just started building me up and speaking words of life to me. And I mean, it was like I almost felt my feet coming off the floor. That's how he was speaking to me. Weeks earlier, it was up one side, down the other side. And I was like, wow, Lord. I didn't say that at the time, but I, I'm, I'm feeling this. I'm like, wow, Lord. And he just encouraged me, and without me even asking him, he said, and I want you to know, I am 100% behind you in where God is calling you. And I said, wow, Jesus, you have done this. On the porch, I would have come up with a plan how to tell them a thing or two about their life. But on the inside... God broke my heart, and God, that released the Holy Spirit to speak in their heart, and God broke their heart. Then there was a licensing planned. It was later ordained then, but that night of the licensing, the second brother, I had not, I'd talked to him about other stuff, but not about this, but we felt at peace about moving ahead. But that night of the licensing, I don't know how you do it in your congregation, but back then we did it this way. You know, we had, we had the, the, the charge and all that. And then afterwards at dismissal, you know, we, my wife and I, of course, our children were just little tykes. And so they weren't up front there. But my wife and I were standing up front. And people would follow through after church and would encourage us, God bless you, praying for you. Well, here comes the second brother in line. Now, I had not really talked to him much about this, but I just remember when he came up to me. And he shook my hand and he just held it there for a while. And he looked at me right in the eyes. And with a smile, he said, just so you know, I'm 100% behind you. And to this day, any one of those brothers, any one of them, in fact, one of them passed away now, went into eternity. But any time I see any of those, a Jesus hug. Hallelujah. On the porch, we figure out how to get even. But I pray tonight, Holy Spirit, take me in. Break me. I want to swim in the living water. In the presence of God is where relationships are restored. Attitudes are changed because our inner man is being strengthened. We get out of religious duties and acts and performance and we learn how to be in Him. And we quit following people 
but we fall on our knees and we say, holy, 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 are you Lord God? And we compare our life with the holiness of God. So Lord, tonight, would you not allow me to sit on the porch too long, but take me in? And that will be the invitation tonight. If you feel like just dry, yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but, but tonight, Holy Spirit, take me off the porch and take me in. Could we stand together tonight as we process? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, I pray tonight, right now, I thank you for this dear group of people here tonight. Lord, I thank you for each one that is here, oh God. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, I don't know where we find ourselves tonight, but I pray that somehow through the Holy Spirit, you would, you would draw us to yourself, Lord. Just, just draw us to yourself, Lord. If we're here tonight and we've, we've not had a relationship with you, we're, we're maybe not even on the porch, oh God, would you, would, would you Lord, draw us here tonight? And Lord, taste and see that you are good. And that you died, that, that moment when that veil was ripped and rent, that, that was because, Jesus, you died. You opened it up for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved according to your word. But others tonight, maybe we've been on the porch too long. I sit there sometimes too long and I dry up. But Lord, would you take me in and pop me? Lord, just take me in and keep me. Lord, restore, renew, put my life together, put, put my shattered dreams together, put it all together, Jesus. I trust you. Lord, I don't want to take my own way. I don't want to live my own life. I don't want to control my own things. But Lord, a full surrender where I, I, I don't just settle for waist deep or even neck deep. But Lord, I want to fully swim in your life-giving water tonight. Put my life together. Uh, empower me. Encourage me. Anoint me, oh God. Help me, Jesus.